Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the penultimate of this set of Salerno shows. I still have a couple more I'm trying to get scheduled for October, it'll be now. But anyway, joining me today uh, for a second time is Liz Coward, live from Singapore, to talk about the Royal Army Medical Corps units at Salerno. Liz is the author of Blood and Bandages. Links to purchase it are in the description below. I'm holding up my copy there, and it's definitely worth getting. And it's not a pedic addict, and it's not it's not a doorstep. You can get through it in a couple of days. Not that we don't we don't like Peter Caddick Adams books, but you know, my postman has to deal with the hernia of bringing a Peter Caddick Adams book up to my doorstep. Anyway, without further ado, I'll bring Liz Liz in. How are you today, Liz? Very well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me back. And hi, everybody. And as I was just saying to you, Liz, I haven't actually done a show on this channel about how the Royal Army, Royal Army Medical Corps set up its field ambulances. ambulances. There's some terminology that that changes from the Great War to the Second World War, and people who understand it kind of throw around those terms without necessarily un realizing that some people don't don't understand them. With the infantry, we kind yes. of understand battalions and companies and things like that, but the the Medical Corps has its own language. So when you were investigating mm -hmm. this, writing your book, you know, did, did you did you struggle with the the, the the setup changes as the war went on? Yes, because they do. They do. Um... A lot of the people that wrote the manuals for the Second World War served in the First World War. So what they tend to do is switch the terminology over. So when Bill first goes into action, for example, um, in Amphidaville, I have been used to the terminology um, RAP, ADS and MDS. And suddenly he starts talking about a CCP. And it's like, oh, OK, a CCP and it's a casualty collecting post. And he would also talk about things like a forward advanced dressing station which would be an aid um an rap so yeah you start having to sort of like get in your head roughly um what the pattern is and then appreciate that if somebody is describing where they are you sort of have to say right okay i think it fits into that yeah and it, and it is a bit we talk a lot about how aviation technology improved in world war ii and carriers and things like that but mm. the, the the job of treating people who'd been wounded also went through massive changes in both the technology and the drugs and administration, but also the organization. And, you know, we've all seen those famous sort of charts explaining how, how much more likely a casualty was to survive in Vietnam compared to the American Civil War. And all the way through that process, the, the system is being refined mm -hmm. and made better all the time. And I think it gets overlooked because people like talking about the marks of Spitfire and the marks of, uh, of, mm -hmm. of, that kind of technology but without the work done to improve the medical facilities a lot yes. less people would have come back from the war absolutely and they are learning all the time and they're incredibly agile as well so they will be saying right okay this didn't work so we're going to try this instead um i don't know enough about the actual history to say when blood transfusions came in when penicillin came in the dates for those sorts of things but you are having all those medical in place that's making a radical change on the on the battlefront for example the survival rates with abdominal injuries i mean basically you had an abdominal injury in the first world war that you were done for in the second world war you've got yeah. a chance of surviving so yeah you do have radical shifts well as you've always you've come armed with a powerpoint which you will take us through and folks there are and welcome for those of us who are here i know it's a different time of day than we normally stream but um far away with your question for liz as we go along but basically we're going to learn about the field ambulances on the beaches of salerno Fabulous. Thank you very much, Paul. Right. So I'm going to go and just give a, a basic understand, basic explanation of what a field ambulance is. So we're all on the same page to start off with. Essentially, a field ambulance is a mobile medical unit attached to an infantry division. You had roughly three field ambulances attached to, to each division because there was a field ambulance attached to each brigade. And such was the importance of a field ambulance that if the field ambulance had taken too many casualties and it could perform properly, the entire brigade would be taken out of the line. So it was that crucial to the brigade. Now, the field ambulance, um, the Royal Army Medical Corps, is part of the Royal Army Medical Corps, and we're just looking at people at the top end of the evacuation chain. I'll go through that in detail later. But essentially, it's a non-combatant regiment. These guys are all working under the Geneva Convention and with their Red Cross bazaars that they'll be wearing, those are all with the Red Cross. Now, just to 
make absolutely sure that people understand that when you had your stretcher bearers, the infantry stretcher bearers, they would have SB on their white bands as stretcher bearers. They were not covered by the Red Cross. The guys for the actual Red Cross were the non-combatants, Royal Army Medical Corps, and they were. Their role was to treat all the wounded and they had to treat them equally. So if you had German and Italian wounded on a battlefield, you would be treating, collecting and evacuating them as well. And Bill, William Earl, the, the Star of Blood and Bandages, always said that 90% of the time, the Germans respected the Red Cross and the Geneva Convention. Now, with your fundamentals with a field ambience, you're looking at four things, safety, speed, distance and mobility. Safety, you're looking at safety of the personnel as well as the casualties. The personnel are highly trained staff. They are difficult to replace, particularly towards the end of the war. OK, they needed to ensure that they kept themselves safe and didn't take any risks, because as much as anything else, if they were injured, who was going to be collecting the wounded? You also have the safety of the casualties. Because whenever you see sort of like battlefield scenarios and you have an incoming and a shell is coming across, people will hit the deck or they'll dive into a hole or they'll quickly dig a strip trench, strip, slip trench if they possibly can. If the nursing orderlies are moving a casualty on a stretcher and a shell comes in, they can't take cover. They have to keep going and then just sort of like, like keep their fingers crossed that nothing's going to happen to them. So they had to ensure that they could only move in safety. So in lulls in fighting and things like that. Um, speed, um, a field ambulance is moving people back as fast as possible. They are undertaking rudimentary medical care. They will do life-saving care, for example, stopping a hemorrhage or something like that, but they can't do anything more than the quickest and the most basic medical care. Their role is to get them away from the front line back to the main dressing station so they can be sorted out and moved on to a unit that can actually take care of them properly. So speed, and the quicker you get the guys back, the greater their chances are of survival. Distance is another fundamental. The field ambulance does not want to get caught up with fighting units. If it does, it is a legitimate target as well as the fighting units. So what you tend to have is you will have your field ambulance units. The first one, the regimental aid post, is by the front line, but the ones behind it are further away from the front line on the basis that it's a safer place to be. What you don't want is to be intermingled with the infantry, which is what happened at Anzio, and that's when it became absolutely ter terrifying, and they took on an awful lot of casualties. So if you think, when you think about a field ambulance, think of those four things as your mm. guiding principle when they're working. Um, right, let's look at side three, th three now. Okay, I spoke about the evacuation chain and I hope you can see it clearly on here. Oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself there. Okay, right, there we go. Right, what we're looking at is we're looking at this top area here. Can you see that quite clearly, Paul? Is that all right? We can't see your mouse, but we can just describe where you're pointing. Okay. <laughs> okay, right. If you can see the blocks of solid grey at the top there, that says troops in the front line. Okay, that's your front line. Now, just behind it, you've got little triangles, and those are RAP, regimental aid posts. Now, it would be the regimental stretcher bearers that would be taking men to the regimental aid posts. Then behind that, you have an ADS, okay? The four RAPs are feeding into the ADS. That's the advanced dressing station. And then behind that, you have another square box, and that's the MDS, the main dressing station. Now, essentially, the field ambulance is operating between the front line, the RAPs, and the MDS. That's the official line, that that's where they're operating. In practice, they're sometimes operating in no man's land, particularly if casualties have been left there. They will be going into no man's land. And as William said, they will operate wherever they're required.
but that's essentially the area that they live in. They're not going back to the other larger box called the CCS, which is the Casualty Clearing Session uh, Station, because that's under the control of another part of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Now, how they're actually moving the people back from the regimental aid post just behind the front line, they will use all and any modes of transport available. That can often mean if you're a, a regimental aid post going back to the advanced dressing station, that's about 2,000 yards, about a mile. Sometimes you'll be carrying the casualty, either on your back or with the bosun's left. You will be bringing him back on a stretcher. If you're lucky, you will have jeeps going forward. But if you're in the Italian mountains, you'll be having sledges and you'll be having mules that are actually moving people from the regimental aid post back to the advanced dressing station. With the advanced dressing station, that's where you've got your ambulances, your motorized vehicles. So the guys are all being gathered and they're being filtered to the ADS. It's there, they'll sort them out, they'll put them on the ambulances, they'll either be seated or they'll be stretcher carers, um, stretcher cases, and they will be driven back to the main dressing station, which is anywhere between two to five miles back from the front line. All of these, part roughly from the main dressing station, are under fire. The um, regimental aid post is within rifle and machine gun fire. The advanced dressing station or is within range of medium artillery. Okay, and your main dressing station, your main dressing station, depending how close you are to the front line, if you're two miles to the front line, you're also going to be in range of artillery. It's only when you get further back and you're about five miles behind, you're relatively safe. Mm. And I'm glad okay. you explained, Liz, about that you know, kind of almost paradoxical um, problem they have of needing to be as close to the front line as possible to, to be able to give the maximum care, but at the same time not running the risk of, of you know, that uh, the, the, the status they've earned of the Red Cross, you know, being a non-legitimate target means they have to look at consider that factor as well i never really weighed up that that problem of 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 being wanting to be where you're you're most needed but having to keep that sense of um of the status the unique status you're at and keep that there because as you said there most cases in the eto the germans the axis would respect this but you know you don't know how long it's going to go for you don't know at what point they might think, hang on, you're you're cheating this now. You know, you're you, like you said, the stretcher bearers who perhaps you know someone carrying a rifle over his shoulder whilst evacuating a, a wounded man that then contravenes these these terms that are that are have been agreed to, but it's fragile, isn't it? Yes, and um, sometimes they're abused, and you get those cases um, in Anzio where under the guise of the Red Cross, you had Germans going ahead and saying they're collecting casualties and they're working with the, they're actually Red Cross um, staff. And then you'd find about 20 minutes later, the area they just come to collect their men from beside the British, um, by the, beside the British posting uh, position would suddenly come under fire. And then actually meant that for a period in Anzio, there were no collections of any wounded taking place at all because they felt that the Red Cross was being abused. And the other thing to bear in mind um, is that nighttime, when they're going out on night missions to no man's land, Red Cross can't be seen. Yeah. So that's when they're in real danger. And what they try to do is when they went out, they tried to go in small groups of, say, six to eight um, and they would always go out on their bellies. They'd be using hand signals so they couldn't be seen. Um, but they would try and go out in small numbers to um, to recover the wounded because the larger the number they went out in, the more likely they were to be considered an infantry raiding yeah. party. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, and their biggest fear was being caught in crossfire. And these guys, before they actually get to slow the two field ambulances we're going to be talking about, they'd actually been through that in, uh, in Fuderville. Okay, thank so, you. Let's go forward. Right, so just giving you a quick example of a regimental aid post. So at the regimental aid post, 
The wounded are going to be treated by the regimental MO, the regimental medical officer, with the assistance of um, REMC police. Okay, um, it is rudimentary shelter that you have there. We're talking about somewhere like behind a behind a rock, um, a blanket strung between two trees to provide some sort of shelter and shade. They could be gathered there as well. So it's it really is just getting them out of danger. You're not talking about a structure that's going to be providing much shelter or, or protection for them at all. You can get into a disused trench, then fine, you would go with that. Um, it's very rudimentary first aid care. With some of these RAPs, you could have up to 40 men gathering in an RAP that the stretcher bearers were bringing in. And that's why the nursing orderlies were constantly going forward because you could not allow your RAPs to get clogged up. So they're constantly bringing them back. So that gives you a rough idea of what's going to be going on with, a, with an RAP. You can see there's no shelter there at all, essentially. They're out in the open. So then they'll be moving from the regimental, so the regimental day post, the car going forward and back, whatever means possible. Okay, and they're bringing them back to the advanced dressing station. Now, that's a post that the REMC them themselves have decided on that location. The RAP is decided by the um, infantry. They decide on where the RAP is going to go. The REMC decide on the location of the um, advanced dressing stations. They will be as far forward as military um, conditions will permit because of the point you just made earlier speed we need to get the guys back quickly and also if there's no means of transport apart from a stretcher your nursing order is going to get exhausted because they are carrying wounded men for a mile to drop them off then they've got to go back again because they've got to keep on emptying the RAPs so they'll be as far forward as military commissions will permit Again, it's urgent care being provided. They will check splints. They will check hemorrhaging. They will check anything that's going to kill them immediately. That's what they'll try and um, handle. But they've got basic equipment there. We're talking about bandages. We're not talking about surgical equipment that's going to be there. So this is going to be an ambulance that is waiting at the ADS, waiting for the guys to come back from the regimental post to start ferrying them back to the main dressing station. And as you can see in the background there, it's a building. And that was often what would be used for the advanced dressing stations because you are trying to protect them now from gas and shell attacks. And because you've got ambulances there, you need them near roads. So then we'll now move back to our last um, part of the field ambulance evacuation chain. And that's the main dressing station, which is the actual field ambulances HU. That's where... HQ company will be based. When they get there, they'll go into a reception center, details will be taken, and then they will be sorted out into those that can be kept there. And there's a big caveat there, can be kept there or need to be evacuated to a more suitable uh, unit as quickly as possible. So then they'll just weed them out. They'll send them off to, say, a, a field surgical unit. They'll send them back to a casualty clearing centre. They will send them wherever they need to go. Now, I mentioned retaining um, retaining casualties. And if we go back to those four principles, they've got to remain mobile. So they will only retain casualties if they think they're going to be staying in that position for a few days, in which case they will keep those casualties there on the basis that they can be moved back up to the front line quite quickly, okay? Because remember, the wounds haven't been properly assessed at this point. They've just been getting them back. So if there's a likelihood that they could cover within two to three days and they know they're going to be there, they will keep them there. Otherwise, they will be moving people out. Because what they have to do is they have to be able to move without notice. If their brigade moves, the field ambulance moves. Now, the locations could be near, they've got to be near road and water. They would often pick on a schools or hospitals or get together a whole tented, um, uh, tented network if they couldn't do that. So those are your three models, well, your three main units of the field ambulance, the, the, uh, the RAPs, the ADS, and the MDS. 
So when you're thinking about a field eminence, think that they're always trying to replicate that model wherever they go. Okay, right. So let's look now at the 56 London Division. So we're now going to be moving towards Italy now. So the guy here is uh, the late William, the late great William L, um, who um, who I work with to produce blood and bandages. We started when he was 96, and his recall was astonishing. I mean, he could recall things within days of the events actually taking place. Absolutely incredible. So he was a fantastic source. Now, uh, he was a nursing orderly class two in the 214 field ambulance. There are three classes of nursing orderlies. You all come in, um, and you come in as class three. Then you take your exams if you pass them, and you show a demonstrable inclination to care for the sick you'll be kept. Um, and then if you show a particular skill, you'll be taking further exams. And that's what Bill showed. So he became a class two. And class ones are things like nurses. Now, just to make, just to make the point, the RMC is not comprised of conscientious objectors. There are conscientious objectors in the RMC. But essentially, nursing orderlies like Bill join the RAMC because they had some connection with the medical profession. Bill's connection was that he worked as a chemist assistant in Boots the Chemist. But you also right. had St. John's Ambulance staff, you had Red Cross staff, you had, um, you had um, people that worked within hospitals. His sergeant major was a mental health nurse. So you have people associated with the medical industry that are tending to come into the, rec to the RAMC. Now, the 214 Field Ambulance is attached to the 169 Infantry Brigade, the Queen's, okay? And the other brigade in the 56th Division that landed at Salerno was the 167th Infantry Brigade, and it had its own field ambulance, and that was uh, called the 167th Field Ambulance, so easy to remember. Yeah. Uh, and then just to reiterate that point, the brigade has to have a field ambulance. If the effectiveness of the field ambulance is jeopardized in any way, that brigade will be withdrawn from the line. Are you with me so far? I haven't blinded you. I haven't spoken too no, much. No, I'm, I'm following. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, if I'm good, then the viewers are probably good as well because I'm the thick <laughs> one here. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so I, I wasn't implying that. There you go. Right, so let's go on. Right, so Salerno. Now, you're all going to be familiar with all the landing beaches here, so I'm just going to do a very, it's going to be very basic um, intro here. Right? Can you see the Red X McCreary? Yep. Okay. Yep. On that map, you've got the 46 and you've got the 56. Okay. We're just looking at the 56 here. The 56 are landing on two beach beaches. They're landing on Sugar Beach and they're landing on Roger Beach. Okay. The Queens are landing on Sugar Beach. Now, wherever the brigade goes, the field ambulance follows. So if the Queens are landing on Sugar Beach, the field ambulance, as sure as God's got little apples, are following them. They're going to be right behind. Okay? So you've got the, the Royal Fusiliers and the Oxford Bucks. They are landing on Roger Beach. So you've got the 167 field ambulance are following them in. Okay? Now... The field ambulance would have been told, both field ambulances would have been told in the days leading up to these invasions what the objectives of the brigades are because they need to ensure that they're positioning themselves in the right place and they've got the right number of stretchers, they've got the right teams going forward. Now, the, the Queen's objective was to capture Monte Corvino Airfield. Okay, so um, we are looking, if you can spot Battapaglia on the map, I'm so sorry I can't enlarge here. Um, if you look to the west of that, that's roughly where the airfield is going to be. Yep. Okay. And then you've got the 167th. Their primary objective, and it was the 8th and 9th Royal Fusiliers, was to proceed direct to Battapaglia to capture the town, heights, and hold all roads and bridges. Okay. So that's the battle plan. So that's exactly what the field ambulance are going to be following. So. 
let's see what happens. So we're now, I'm now going to take you uh, on a journey where we're going to look at the actual landing, about the first hour of the landing. And then we're going to look at both field ambulances for the landing, then both field ambulances on the 9th and the 10th. We're not going to go beyond the 9th and the 10th. Okay, so the 214 Field Ambulance lands on Sugar Beach. They arrive, if you can see the craft behind you, okay, that's an LCI, a Land and Craft Infantry, okay. This photograph is actually from Normandy, but it's a very effective representation of, of what was going on. So if you can imagine the Field Ambulance is on that craft, they get to their release point at, at 1.55 in the morning. Okay, H hour is at 3.30. The first assault troops are going in at 3.30. This is how soon the field ambulance are moving. They are moving H hour plus 20 minutes. Mm. They are coming in that quickly after the infantry. Okay, A companies are coming. William actually came in with uh, A1 section um, at 8.25 and they kept their time. The ramp goes down, they leap into the water. He actually leapt into waist high water, okay? And then they're wading ashore. They're wading ashore under fire. Bear in mind, these men have got no arms, they're non combatants. They're wading inshore. They've got stiff opposition from the German positions, but they've also got a naval bombardment from behind. You can just imagine the noise that's going on mm. there. Okay. They get on the beach, they scatter get up and they dig in. They just take cover and they dig in, okay? All they can do at that stage is keep themselves safe. They were watching the wounded and the dead on the beach, but there's nothing they can do because at that point, it's too unsafe to go out and do anything. At this point, there are no regimental aid posts because stretcher bearers are gonna be moving forward with a brigade. So basically, the wounded can only look to the RAMC men to help them. They can't do anything, okay, until there is a lull in the fighting, okay? So in that first 30 minutes, a company, they're all scattered, are shuffling towards each other and trying to get back together to make a makeshift advanced dressing station. Remember, that's the unit that they're used to yeah. working with, okay? What they're going to use for shelter is probably going to be a, a sanjin. That's going to be about it. So, so during the yell, they're going to during the lull, they're going to treat and gather the wounded. And at this point, I'm going to read from blood and bandages because this is what Bill said, and I don't think there's any other. There's no better description of this really. So this is what he said. We had to wait until the navy stopped shelling before we could go out to treat the injured. We relied on the signalers to tell us when, and the moment we got the go-ahead, Sergeant Abley told us to deal with the wounded we could see. We raced around because we didn't know how long we had until the Navy restarted the bombardment. Sometimes there were six or eight of us helping the injured. Other times it was just Frank and I. Those that were conscious were delighted to see us, and we gave them some water from their water bottles. Some of the men just needed a bit of help to get up and walking again. And if they couldn't because they had a leg wound, we made a tour tourniquet to stop the bleeding. Every soldier had his own first field dressing tied to his thigh, and we used that if the wound wasn't too big. If it was, we ripped up his trousers or improvised with whatever came to hand. The stretchers were landing later, so Frank and I would make a chair by linking our wrists together to carry those that couldn't walk. As long as a man could put his arms around us, we could get him out of danger. Sometimes the injured were in such a dangerous spot that we had to get them to a safer place before we could even start treating them. Once we'd done that, we'd leave them there and go and find another casualty. If a man was so seriously wounded that we couldn't move him at all, Sergeant Abley would detail two of us to remain with him until more help arrived. Wow. Well. Yeah. So that's what's happening in the first hour or so on the beach. 
And just a quick question so, for you, Liz. Um, I'm assuming yeah. when you've got an amphibious landing like this, the infantry who would have their own certain numbers of, of medically trained, you know, in the British Army, nursing orderlies, medics in the American Army, they would be moving forward with the infantry. All casualties on the beach would be left there for these units. Am I right there? Yeah, you basically, what you've got with the stretcher bearers who are going to be the ones that are medically trained, they're going to be able to do basic first aid. Yeah. The Royal Army yeah. Medical Corps men are much better trained. They have much greater depth of need and an ability to actually treat people. The stretcher bearers are moving forward with a brigade because the stretcher yeah. bearers have always got to follow the brigade. Okay, They haven't got no time at this point to hang around and start gathering an, an RAP. They're under fire. They've just got yeah. to get off that beach. Yeah. Okay, So at this point, it is only left to... Um, whatever REMC sections are on the beach to actually look after the wounded at this point. Thanks for clarifying, because that's that's age old dilemma in that if an infantry unit suffers a casualty and one person stops to look after that casualty, then a corporal stops to look after that person there. Suddenly you may have taken five or six people out of the out of the uh, the battle. Uh, when, as you said there, they're not actually skilled in being able to do that job when there are other people coming up who are doing that job. So for, for numerous reasons, it's it's reducing the, the effectiveness of the invasion. So, you know, and I remember yeah. speaking to lots of veterans of D-Day saying the worst thing, one of the worst things about the day was being told to move on and leave your friend. You know, your best friend has been hit, whether it's a minor wound or a serious wound. You, you're not meant to stay and look after him. And I think uh, for the, from a human point of view, that would be a very, very hard hurdle to overcome. You know, you, you want to see that person that you, you care about get the treatment they deserve, but you've got a job to get to get on with. That's, that's exactly right. And to be honest, there is help behind. It's not that yeah. the help isn't there. Help is coming. You just have to wait. Um, yeah. And there is a, there is a, a, a it's, it's in Amphedaville that there is a terribly, terribly sad um, example of where this happens, where the guys from the 214 are going out um, into no man's land to collect some casualties. And two nursing orderlies are working together, bearing in mind they would have trained together for two years. And people are put together that, that get on well with each other. And they've rescued this one casualty and they unfortunately run into uh, another German counterattack. And the casualty they're rescuing has a grenade underneath the, the stretcher. They, they're done for. But one nursing orderly has got to make a choice between the regimental stretcher bearer and his friend that he's trained with for two years. Which one can mm. he rescue? And he leaves his friend behind because the regimental stretcher bearer is less badly wounded. And he, he looks at his friend, Musto, he's unconscious and he says i can't do anything for him and that's desperate yeah so oh, let's wow. move forward yeah so we're now looking at the 167 field ambulance right that's coming up on roger beach alongside they're coming in later they're coming up for um 35 uh, again, they're coming on the, on the same vessel and they're landing with the MDS. They're coming later because they're coming in with an awful lot more equipment. All the field ambulances have probably got together and said, right, we've got this number of, um, of, of sections coming on that can treat the wounded. We now need to get more equipment on so we can actually do more serious, we can actually do more serious rescues. So they're landing um, with their MDS, their, their basic MDS, main dressing station. Again, they're landing in waist height water, but they've landed in the wrong place, and that will come into play later on. Again, they're met with stiff opposition, just like the 214 field ambulance. So, what they do is they push forward 200 yards up and shelter behind a small sand dune, and they dump their stores and equipment. The field ambulance, the officer commanding the field ambulance at that time, makes contact with the officer commanding the 8th RF. And whilst they're together talking, a German pistol battery opens fire. And he opens fire in such a way as he's, he, he has separated the RAMC from the MDS. So he's got to get back to the MDS. He's got to get back to his men to reassure them. Eventually, he does get back to them. And by that time, the commanding officer of the entire field ambulance, who Colonel Brown is already there. 
and the men are all told to scatter and dig in slit trench sit in in um, dig in slit trenches. Eventually, the coastal battery is put out by HMS Lafayette that comes close inshore and takes the battery out of action. But it's only at 7.30 that they actually start trying to get back to where they should have been. So there's a recce to see if they can actually get back to the correct assembly point. And they find the route is clear. And at that point, they actually start moving back to where they should be on the beach. OK, so that's what's happening with the 167 field ambulance. Unfortunately, what happens with them at Salerno, um, this is just an indication of how bad it's going to start getting for them. So we move on now. So now we're looking at the, the day. OK, so now we're off the beach and we're looking at sort of like first hour onwards. Now, H plus 60 minutes. B1 section is coming in. Now, the importance of B1 section is that they are carrying the stretchers. Because when the men were training in Tripoli, A section were training in Tripoli, they were basically being taken out of boats, jumping into the sea and running back onto the shore as quickly as possible. They found that they could not run in quickly enough carrying stretchers. So that's why when William jumps into the water, they are just carrying their basic kit. So it's an hour in, the stretchers turn up. Now that then will change the whole complexion of, of rescues. So they, they land with the stretchers and by dawn, they started to recreate that whole collection where it would have been the, the regimental A post with the um, advanced dressing station behind it. They're starting to recreate that pattern where you've got A company collecting people and bringing them down to the advanced and then eight or nine o'clock the ads is moving off the beach to approximately one mile inland and that's where the site of the 214 main dressing station is going to be and this is where you're looking at those other fundamentals where you're starting to get differences between the different parts of the, the RIP, the ADS yeah. and the MDS. You yeah. want to start creating distances between those. Okay, so there now, ADS is now a mile from the beach, okay? And that will eventually be converted to a main dressing station. Seven hours after the initial landing at 3.30, um, uh, a duck is, is landing with heavier equipment, okay? They were absolutely brilliant for actually landing um, equipment at Salerno. The difficulty was they were so long, they were very unmaneuverable and they were starting to cause problems as the invasion went on. Now, by midday, the beach MDS is set up. So if you have got a beach MDS a mile on the shore, that means in front of it, you have an advanced dressing station, and in front of that, you have regimental A posts. OK, so, you know, the battle's all moving forward. OK, and then alongside it, you've got another field ambulance setting up as well. OK, so you're starting to see a pattern now. You've got the, the water, the beach, the MDSs, which means that progress is being made. Now, at the end of the day, the 214 had only suffered one wounded. OK, um, and you've got 11, excuse me, 11 British casualties are being evacuated from Sugar Beach. Because remember, you haven't got a casualty clearing section, whereas mm. you have before. Mm. If you're on land, you've got a hospital ship instead. So you're getting them on to the um, landing craft infantry, back to the hospital ships. So that's your evacuation route. OK, so that's the end of uh, day one for the 214 field ambulance. Now, the 17 ambulance, the rest of the day is relatively quiet for them, which is a blessing because of what will happen the next day to them. They finally get to their assembly area. So they arrived at 4.30 in the morning. They finally get to the assembly area at nine o'clock. Okay, wise decision. The first thing they're gonna do is have breakfast. I think it's a very good decision really. Um, and then they slowly begin to open up the MDS. 
And by 10 o'clock, you've got a horse, a two horse dray is being sent down to collect the stores they couldn't carry that were left on the beach in the wrong position. OK, so a dray horse has gone down to collect the rest of that equipment. And then by midday, you've got an ambulance car full of casualties is being taken to the MDS and then back on to uh, the landing craft out to the hospital ships. So you're starting to get that evacuation chain is already in place by midday. OK. And then at one o'clock, the, um, the quartermaster arrives with the remainder of the, the uh, MDS personnel. And then the transport arrives at seven o'clock in the evening. So these systems are being put in place very, very quickly. I, I mean, the organisation is, is phenomenal. So, are we okay? Should we move forward? Yeah, brilliant. Right, okay. So, we're now on to the next day. Now, of course, the next day in army parlance starts pretty much one minute after midnight. So, on the 10th of September, at one o'clock in the morning, things not going so well. Remember that the RAP is in front of the MDS. The two Fifth Queens, RAP and Battalion Headquarters, are ambushed during a move. Okay. A move will be taking place if they're probably hoping to advance. Okay. But that has been ambushed. Three nursing orderlies are missing and a body is recovered the next day. One ambulance car is captured, but a driver escapes. Okay. Now that's a major setback for mm. the, um, the field ambulance. Okay. Uh, you've got you've probably got about 50 nursing orderlies going on um, in that first um, the first landing. I'd say you certainly haven't got a whole um, a whole complement of nursing orderlies on the beach by this time, and you've just lost three. Okay, and you've lost an ambulance car. So um, I will assume because of the war drivers didn't tell me any different that. The advance then to, to to move that RAP forward is going to stop. If that one's been ambushed, if anything, they're going to start pulling it back because that means that it's too close to the front line. It might actually be in front of the front line at that point. So at the end of the day, the unit casualties is one killed and two wounded. And amongst that wounded, um, I told you that story a little bit um, before about the the nursing orderly that had to leave his friend Musto. Yep. This was the this was the guy that had to leave Musto. Sherwood was injured. He had a gunshot wound. Um, so it's quite sad actually that that uh, Sherwood ended up. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he he died, but it was a gunshot wound to the chest. So it would have been uh, pretty serious. Right now we're moving on to what's happening on Roger Beach. Now, remember that the goal of the Royal Fusiliers is to proceed direct to Battapaglia and to take and secure all the roads and the town itself. OK. Um, now, at 5.30, and I'm, I'm naming the people here deliberately. I don't normally name people, but I am here because they're significant. Right. At 5.30, Lieutenant Colonel Brown and Captain Forsyth visit the forward areas. Because remember, we've got an NPS that they've already set up on the beach. They're looking to advance because they need to be close to the front. They're looking at the forward areas. And 15 minutes later, uh, Major Porter and Lieutenant Hobcroft visit the IPs. So they're much closer to the front line. Silence. Then at 11 o'clock, an ambulance driver overhears a message that Lieutenant Colonel Brown has been killed. Okay, there's a silence there for another three hours. And it's at that point Captain Forsyth returns and he is wounded. And I'm now going to read another extract, which again tells you what happened to um, Lieutenant Colonel Brown and why you've got these big gaps in what's going on in the war diary. So, um, Forsyth returns. In jeep, bring from shell wound to the right calf and buttocks. He reported that Brown, Major Porter, and himself were in the area of Battapaglia doing a recce for a site for the ADS. 
They were on the top story of a house when he looked out of the window and saw a German tank approaching. They all went downstairs and took cover behind the building. The tank, however, saw them and opened fire, wounding Major Porter in the leg, compound, fracture, tibia and fibula, and wounding Captain Forsyth. The tank approached close and stopped. Lieutenant Colonel Brown spoke to the tank commander and pointed out his Red Cross facade and went to get a stretcher from one of the jeeps. He brought the stretcher back and he and Captain Forsyth were lifting Major Porter onto it when a second tank opened fire from another direction, killing Lieutenant Colonel Brown and wounding Major Porter in the head. Captain Forsyth got into a ditch and crawled away to try and get help for Major Porter. Captain Forsyth was picked up by the brigade signal sergeant and came straight to the MDS, stopping only to tell people on the way to try and rescue Major Porter. What had happened to Lieutenant Hopcraft, he did not know. Hmm. So, I think it's really significant there. You've got them going in as before. They're going in to find a building for their ADS. That's exactly what they would be doing. Okay, it's the courage of the um, lieutenant colonel that he actually goes out to the tank commander and just points to his Red Cross facade, and the tank commander stops. And it's only the other one that comes round, trigger happy. That's it. So that's what's happening with the 167. So you're now getting a field ambulance that's, that's losing casualties at quite a high rate. OK. So we then get a report coming back at 15 minutes later. The report is coming back that Batapaglia is surrounded and the guards are counterattacking. Counter 45 minutes later, Captain Coldham is returning with an ambulance car full of casualties and confirms that the 9th Royal Fusiliers are surrounded, surrounded and Lieutenant Colonel Milliston is wounded but refuses to leave the RAP until the remaining wounded are evacuated. A few minutes later, there is a rescue attempt to try and get back to the major porter. You've actually got no who are going beyond the front line to try and get back into Batapaglia to get hold of one of their own. They're forced back under heavy fire. And then at the end of that day, it just goes back to business as usual for the 167, where they're actually advising people they think that their RAPs are in the wrong place, despite mm. the casualties that we've just taken. So that essentially is what's happening with the field ambulances that are going up with the 56th Division on those first two days landing well brilliant stuff um it's it, it we've all learned a lot today which is extraordinary um uh your richard is explaining that your internet's getting a bit scratchy so we lost a couple of words oh. in the last bit but it's it's we got we got 99 percent of it so that's so that's good so um you know i mean my, my takeaway from this is that as with a lot of subjects we cover, we don't talk enough about the, the RAMC. We don't we don't talk about their their role enough. You know, the casualties they sustained weren't dramatic. In you compare, we talked about the 36th Division last night losing several thousand men as American unit. We're talking about ones and twos and threes and fours here. But the responsibility they have for dozens, hundreds of other lives is is the thing, isn't it? You know, you lose lose one of these incredibly skilled people from the front line. You're you're mm. you're reducing the effectiveness of a field ambulance dramatically. Yes, yes, you are, and it's not just a case of training them either. These men have got to be—they're pretty. I, I view them as super soldiers, really, because they've not only got to be as strong as all your your basic infantrymen, because they've got to be able to carry um, unconscious casualties as well. They've got to have an ability to look at a wound rather than the uniform. So they've got to be completely impartial. They cannot show fear or horror when they're looking at someone who's wounded. Um, they have always got to be upbeat. They've got to be impartial. They, they've just got to keep going as well. I mean, these men, when you're looking at 
them taking a rest at the main dressing station after they've been collecting casualties from the front line. When they go back to the main dressing station, they don't start working. They become ward orderlies, okay? And that's their break time. And then they go forward again. So these guys are working tremendously hard and when there are rest periods as well, they're often going out with the regimental um, um, RMOs to do sick parades. Yeah. So these guys are constantly working, constantly working. So yeah, and I think they're. I think and they're I, I, yeah, from my from my Normandy uh, knowledge, I always found that soldiers will gripe about rations. They'll gripe about you know the fact they're wet. They'll gripe, but but they they need to know that there's a system in place to recover them when they're wounded. That, and and that's why you know you get in Normandy chaplains going out trying to recover patrols that were shot up because of that that. It's not. It's gonna. It's not a. It's not publishing. Soldiers aren't told we're gonna do our best to bring you back. But that's the. That's the understanding you have as a soldier. You understand that you're gonna take risks. You understand that you may not come back from a battle um, uh, without being wounded, or maybe even you, you, you'll be killed. But you like to think that there is a system to look after you. That you are not just a, a number. You are a human being, and that the, the 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 organization behind you will bring you back. And I think, as you as you've made it clear, we this organization. To do that doesn't get enough um, recognition, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, you've got one more slide to go, I think. I mean, is that right? Oh, I think that's just a. That's oh, just yeah. a thank, thank you. you. Yeah. No, <laughs> so well, 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 what we'll do is we will leave it there and then invite you back at some point in the future to carry on the story, perhaps as we get into the latter, next part of the Italian campaign. And in the meantime, folks. Um, go out there and get the book because um, it'll fill in a much needed gap in your understanding of how uh, these invasions and amphibious operations took place. Because, you know, we always focus on the infantry and paratroopers and fighter pilots, but there's this very important element behind that, that, that perhaps isn't, as we said, getting the coverage. So there we are. Um, I will let you go, Liz, and I will speak to you again next time, yeah. folks. I'm back again this evening with Dr. Alexander Clark. We are talking about the, the Navy support for the landings, and then I'm still trying to get some more Slano shows set up for the middle of October. Cheers, everybody. I will see you all again. This is Paul Wooders for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye.